Good day. Uh, we're here in the office at St. George's Anglican Church in London, Ontario, because we are not able to gather as God's people where we normally would. Throughout this province, churches are shuttered. But why they might be shuttered, we are still people of prayer. We're still God's children. And in these challenging times, it's important that we find ways to hear God's word, to pray, to give thanks to God for life and love, and to try to sort out ways in which we might best be God's people at this challenging, challenging time in our world's history. Blessed be the holy and undivided Trinity, one God, Blessed be God forever. Holy God, in Jesus Christ, you reveal yourself to the world, even when we are blind to see your grace. Open our eyes to see your transforming love in our midst, so that we may see your world anew. Through Jesus Christ, the Savior who shows compassion. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbor, to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, to assure the isolated of our love and your love for your name's sake. Amen. Now, listen to our reading from 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel then set out and went to Rama. This is the word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I have got to tell you that this feels very, very strange. But then again, we are in strange times. Anyone who knows me knows that I can't stand still when I talk. Uh, so to be giving a short homily sitting down is more than a stretch for me, but I'll do the best I can. Our Old Testament story this morning is a fabulous, fabulous story. Samuel had been a father figure and a mentor to Saul, and yet it fell to him to be the one to tell Saul that God had rejected him and rejected his kingship and his reign. And as our story begins today, we hear the words of God saying, Samuel, how long are you going to sit around moping over Saul? I've rejected him. Now you're going to get up and get some oil and go off and anoint a king for me. Samuel was not happy. He was frightened because to anoint a new king, while a current king is still sitting on the throne, that would be treason. And he was very much afraid that Saul would kill him if he got word of it. So the Lord came up with a plan, a little white lie. He said, listen, you're going to go to Bethlehem. You're going to go see Jesse and his sons, and you're going to take a heifer with you. Just tell them you're there to go to church and you're bringing your own offering. Trust me, it'll work. Didn't sound like a good plan, but Samuel decided to go along with it. And so off he went to Bethlehem, dragging his cow behind him. And finally, he, he got to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came out and they were terrified because if Samuel, who was a king maker and a king breaker, had come to them as an agent of Saul, then he was there to exploit them. And if he had come as something other than an agent of Saul, well, that was trouble too. And Samuel said to them, listen, we're going to go to church. We're going to kill us a cow and it's going to be wonderful. But first, go and get Jesse and his sons because we're not going to start without them. And then the wonderful story unfolds that Jesse's sons come before Samuel. The first one, Eliab, who is tall and handsome. And Samuel thought, this is the one. And God said, no, no, that's not the way it works. You remember Saul was the tallest, most handsome man in Israel. How did that work out for you? He's not the one. And one after another, the seven sons of Jesse were passed by him and God rejected all of them. And then there's this wonderful moment when Samuel says, Jesse, is that it? Is that all of your boys? And Jesse said, well, now that you mention it, there is one more. He's kind of the runt of the litter and he's out taking care of the sheep. Samuel said, bring him to me. And so this undervalued eighth son, the runt of the litter, came and God said, that's the one. Samuel, anoint him. He's my king. Walter Brueggemann says that for the hearers of that story, the original hearers of that story, most of whom were people who were marginalized, poor, just trying to scrape out a living that was a huge moment because it was God's way of saying the traditional ways of doing things where the, the beautiful people, the rich, the powerful, the landowners get everything and you get nothing, that's all going to change. Because this insignificant eighth son, this marginalized son, this runt of the litter was going to be God's shepherd for God's people. Something new was blowing in the wind and that something was God's spirit and it rested upon young David and history began to change. God's new version of God's kingdom was about to be introduced. The vision was still the same. It was to be a vision of justice and peace for all God's children. 
The vision was still one where the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants were going to be cared for. That hadn't changed. What had changed was that this young David, this marginalized David, this runt of the litter, was going to make good things possible for all of God's people. And the old patterns of exploitation and exclusion were going to come to an end. Great story. Great story. Well, a bit later, we get introduced to something that was similar. You see, just as, as with David, David was not chosen by human recognition, but by God. So we hear about one who was born not of natural descent, not of human decision, not of a father's will, but one that was born of God. And this one was Jesus, obviously. And at Jesus' baptism, we heard the words, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. And at that moment, the wind blew and the spirit descended upon him mightily and something was in the wind. God's new version of God's kingdom. From that point, Jesus' purpose in life was to bring about that kingdom of justice and peace. Jesus' purpose in life was to get people to claim the Torah, to get people to remember that they had to care for the widow, the orphan, and for the immigrant, to get people to understand that love and mercy and justice and generosity of spirit were not just empty words. That was the kingdom he came to proclaim. It was the kingdom he came to embody. It was the kingdom that he died for, and it was the kingdom that he rose again for to make a reality. And that's the good news, the good news of Jesus. Well, all of that's lovely, but here we are. Here we are in 2020. And nothing looks the same, does it? Nothing looks the same as it did a month ago. Nothing looks the same as it did a week ago. We are in a time where we are talking in cliches about unprecedented times, about uncharted, uncharted waters. And we talk in cliches because we don't have words to describe what we're feeling. Right now, throughout the world, and certainly in this community, people are frightened. They're frightened for their health. They're frightened for their economic future. They're frightened because no one knows what it's going to look like next week or next month. And it is okay to be frightened. It is not okay to be overwhelmed by fear. We are being called to isolate, and that's good. We are not being called to be isolationists. We are at a time, I believe, when we who have been proud to say that we are baptized in the kingdom of God, have been proud to talk of ourselves as being part of the body of Christ, we need to take a serious look about what that means. Because I believe that God's version of the kingdom of God has not changed. But our vision of what our world looks like is changing by the moment. In the midst of it all, it seems to me, we have to understand that the need to care for the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant is stronger today than it ever has been. We need to understand that justice and mercy and generosity of spirit will be desperately, desperately needed when this event is over, whenever that might be. We need to make sure that the words which we espouse are not just empty words. We need to find new ways for this day, new ways for now, to try to respond with loving care to human need wherever we see it. We need to be able to find new ways, different ways, to reach out and to challenge 
unjust structures. We need to find new ways to be God's people. The world is depending on us. Our community is depending on us. Our fellow parishioners are depending on us. And we need to remember, we need to remember that we are not alone. We need to trust that our God has not abandoned us. We need to trust that our God is present because when we trust that our God is present, then that changes everything in terms of how we go about our day-to-day -day lives, how we go about our ministry, how we go about living out our faith. My friends, these are frightening times, but we are people of faith, we are people of prayer, and we will get through this together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation, anxiety, we pray that they may find relief and recovery. We pray for those who are guiding our nation and the nations of the world at this time, those who are shaping national policies, that they might make wise decisions. We pray for doctors, nurses, medical researchers, that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. We pray for the vulnerable, for the fearful, for the gravely ill, and for the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and the protection of God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We are not people of fear. We are people of courage. We are not people who protect only our own safety. We are people who seek to protect our neighbor's safety as well. We are not a people of greed. We are a people of generosity. We are your people, God, giving and loving. Wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. And now please join me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.